I welcome every fan of history and good movies. Today I would like to draw your attention to an old Czech film, made in black and white, that takes place during an important chapter of the Second World War. Namely the attack on one of the most powerful people in the Third Reich, Reinhard Heydrich. Since that time, many movies have been made on the subject, but this 1964 film, to me, best describes the events while simultaneously demonstrating the atmosphere of the time. The film describes the preparation of Czechoslovak soldiers in Britain, their subsequent jump to the protectorate, the attack on Heydrich, and their final battle in one of Prague's churches. This is assassination! <laughs> For better orientation into the plot, it is worth recalling the historical events that preceded the movie's storyline. After the First World War ended in 1918 and the Austro-Hungarian monarchy dissolved, several successor states arose, one of which was the Czechoslovak Republic, with a strong German minority, especially in the border regions. This caused a lot of tension and national friction in the new republic, especially after Hitler came to power in 1933 in neighboring Germany. Hitler had instructed the Sudeten German Party, which represented the vast majority of Czech Germans, to call for greater autonomy. This would ultimately lead to the point in which, if these demands were accepted by the Czechoslovak government, it would mean a de facto loss of control over the border areas, thus connecting border areas to the Third Reich. Pane předsedo, nenaléhejte na mne. Já chci jednat s Henleinem, ale ne o jeho karlovanských požadavcích. Pochopte to, vždyť oni nechtějí nic menšího, než vytvoření nacistického státu v naší republice. To přece není možné, aby jedna část státu byla řízena našimi demokratickými zákony a druhá rasovými, s koncentračními tábory, s gestapem. Kdyby měli Henleinovci takovou to samozprávu, pak už by záleželo je na dobré vůli Hitlera, kdyby se nějakou plebiscitní komedii připojili k říši. Až tam přece nemůžeme pan Germánům ustupovat. Ostatně, v našem parlamentě je dost velká skupina německých poslanců s kladným postojem. Jejich vyznáním je, zemřeme za Československo, protože když jsme Němci, nejsme oni, jsme ani demokraté. Náš stát je zabezpečen spojeneckými smlouvami. Francie svou smlouvu dodrží, o tom jsem pevně přesvědčen, a Velká Británie si tak nenechá porušit Evropě rovnováhu. Teď o připojení Rakouska. German propaganda constantly accused the Czechoslovak government of attacking the German minority. Unfortunately, representatives of some countries believed these false accusations. For example, in a recorded post-war interview with an American army officer and one of the representatives of the Sudeten German party in the Czechoslovak Republic, the confused American officer asks the German, I do not understand. You say that before the war you owned a shop with Czech employees, published German newspapers, graduated from a German university in Prague, reached the rank of sergeant in the Czechoslovak army, and were even in command of Czechs. So, how exactly did they oppress you? Pozval jsem vás, milí lorde Ransimene, abyste mne ještě před schůzí vlády informoval o výsledcích vaší mise v Československu. Byla to kuriozní mise. Vím, ale získali jsme čas a to bylo dobré. Budeme mít ve vládě proti opozici vaše nestrané svědectví. Podle mého mínění nemůže být sporu o tom, že vinu na tom, že všechna jednání stroskotala, i vinu na překotném vývoji situace nesou Henlein a Frank. A mocnost, která stojí za nimi v pozadí. Československá zpráva sice za posledních 20 let nikoho aktivně neutiskovala, ale prokázala takový nedostatek taktu ve vztazí k německému obyvatelstvu, že je možné pochopit jeho rozhorčení. Mohou žít Češi a Němci pospolu? 
Nikoliv. Politika vlády byla doprovázena hroznou korupcí a nezákonitostí. Stížnosti jsou v podstatě oprávněné. Hitler threatened to invade Czechoslovakia by force to protect Czech Germans. Even though the Czechoslovak government treated the Germans fairly and in no way restricted their rights. Today's historians say that the government acted too impassively to growing nationalism and to subtle hassles that began to multiply rapidly. Due to the increasing number of incidents in the border area and Hitler's declaration of impending invasion of Czechoslovakia, the Czechoslovak government was forced to declare mobilization in September 1938, much to Hitler's dismay. German leaders were surprised by the extent to which Czech citizens wanted to defend their homeland. In a short time, over 1 million soldiers had been mobilized. Czechoslovakia had a population of about 15 million people, which included 3 million Czech Germans. This crisis was sent to Munich to be discussed between four European powers, Germany, Italy, France, and Britain. Though even without the participation of the Czechoslovak party, they agreed that Czechoslovakia would withdraw its territory with a predominantly German minority and cede it to the Third Reich. France and Britain placed enormous pressure on the Czechoslovak government to accept the conditions. Thus, the Czechoslovak government accepted these terms in an attempt to maintain the peace. The powers congratulated themselves on preventing war by sacrificing the only democratic pro-Western state in Central Europe. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain even had the honor of appearing with King George VI on the balcony of Buckingham Palace which to date has only been repeated by Winston Churchill. Though Britain, in contrast to France, had concluded no treaty of alliance with Czechoslovakia, and as one British politician said before, Britain is interested in Europe just to the Rhine. In regard to this agreement, Winston Churchill delivered his famous remark, you were given the choice between war and dishonor. You chose dishonor and you will have war. However, the people of Czechoslovakia were shocked. They were brought up with faith in democracy and in the Western powers, and yet when they realized that nobody was fighting for Czechoslovakia, their shock was replaced with anger. Britskou politiku nedělá král, ale kdyby alespoň Polovička těch lidí chtěla reagovat, tak to musí pohnout dolní sněmovnu. Reagovat na naši situaci. Reagovat na to, že je ohrožena poslední demokracie ve střední Evropě. To jim píšu. Protože se zdá, že si toho neráčili všimnout. Ty kurvy jim to dali v tom Mnichově. Celý naše pohraničí hlásili to v rádiu. Celý sunety dali Hitlerovi. Jsme prodaný. Něco se musí stát pro novou vlnu uprchlíků. Musí se najít přístřešní práce, okamžitá pomoc hmotná a zdravotní. Ráno, ráno, ráníčko, ráno, ráno, ráníčko, dřív než vyjde sluníčko, dřív než vyjde sluníčko. Kdo je? Spaste duši, jestli se vám nepodaří zmizet do dnešního večera, 
Tak zítra už se pryč nedostanete. Můj případ není rozhodnutý, ale vy spaste duši. Večer vjede poslední vlak, potom už vyrvou kolejnice a rozmetají pračce. Kde jsou naši vojáci? Nikde nikdo. Kasáda jsou prázdný. Ale prosím vás, ty ještě jsou v pevnostech na hranicích. Ale večer to tam vyklidějí a potom... Jak si to ty lidi představují? Jak vám do večera tohle všechno spakovat a odstěhovat? Dítě drahý. Pojď sem. Jirko. Jste si tam radši dřív. Radši se moc neukazovat. Děkuji vám, pane přednosto. Opatrnosti nikdy nezbývá. Prosím vás, je to tam vzadu na trati u hranic. Tam? Ještě přijede jeden vlak. A navíc už nečekám. Jo. To bych mohl čekat na smrt. Já jsem tam v té kanceláři tak sám. No to je hrůza. Ještě jednou zvednu plácačku a vyskočím na poslední vagón. Já jsem celý vycucanej, paní. Jsem až na dně. Co já jsem prožil v těchto dnech na tomhle nádraží, no to je hrůza. Tak zdar. Vírko, tak v tomhle jezdějí krávy. A ty v tom pojedeme my. Cítíš ten kapitální smrad? No zdar. This was also one of the reasons that the people of Czechoslovakia were more inclined to believe the leaders of the Soviet Union in the East after the war. Following the Munich Agreement, the Czechoslovak army received orders to leave the border fortifications, which were built during the 30s to defend against Germany. The army obeyed the orders from their superiors with gritted teeth. In this way, the deprived state had no hope of existence, and in a few months, Hitler had occupied the rest of the Czech lands, thereby breaking the terms of the Munich Agreement. Slovakia declared the Slovak state in full support of Nazi Germany, and from the Czech part of the broken state, Germany formed the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. For Czech people, the war had actually started one year earlier than for the rest of Europe. Germany was thus able to take over the vast and highly developed Czech industry without a fight. To illustrate, in wartime, the protectorate industry covered 29%, actually one-third of the German war industry, which included the production of weapons, ammunition, planes, tanks, etc. In fact, a full third of the tanks that were used against France in 1940 were made in the protectorate meaning that by agreeing to the Munich Agreement, France had essentially dug its own grave. Some of the Czechoslovak soldiers fled across the border to France after its rapid defeat to Britain. Former Czechoslovak President Beneš also fled to England, where he formed an exile government and enlisted Czechoslovak soldiers to begin forming military units. This process, however, did not go very smoothly as the British government still felt obliged to honor the Munich Agreement. Now, Let's have a look at the film. It begins by showing Heydrich in the protectorate. And just who was Heydrich? At the time of his arrival to Prague, he had already climbed the Nazi hierarchy to the very top, and was the right hand of Himmler, the head of the SS. Heydrich himself was one of the highest SS officers, Obergruppenführer. At the time, he was perhaps the third most powerful man in Nazi Germany, after Hitler and Himmler. Aside from the function of Deputy Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, he had replaced the first protector, Konstantin von Neurath. He was also the head of Interpol, General of Police, Director of Gestapo, the secret police, Head of SD, Sikheinsdienst, which was the intelligence agency of the SS, 
and consequently the head of the main security office, RSHA. He was head of these security forces not only in the protectorate or in Germany, but throughout the territory of all occupied Europe. He was also the architect of the final solution of the Jewish question. Does anyone else want to raise this question now? Because I tell you, I have been asked to direct the release of Germany and all of Europe from the Jewish stranglehold, and I believe that together we will. But the brief remains clear. All of Europe, England, from Lapland to Libya, from Vladivostok to Belfast, no Jews. Not one. The Third Reich had always commissioned him with the most important and complex tasks. For example, the Anschluss of Austria, or for provoking war with Poland. Heydrich made his arrival to Prague on the 27th of September 1941 and immediately arrested the Czech Prime Minister of the Protectorate Government, General Eliash. On the same day, he declared a state of emergency, and the next day had instituted martial law, which would last until January 20th, 1942. Eliash was put on trial and sentenced to death in just three days, but Heydrich left him alive as a hostage. Others, however, were not so lucky, and the order for mass murdering began, including taking the lives of 26 top army generals. An sich ist Heydrich ein unglücklicher Mensch. Wo er hinkommt, um Ordnung zu schaffen, wird er gehasst. In Deutschland, in Norwegen, in Holland und jetzt auch in Prag. Weil er ein ganz gemeiner Henker ist. Er ist kaum zwei Monate in Böhmen und schon hat er über 1000 Menschen hinrichten lassen. Das ist es eben. In einem besetzten Land einen derartigen Hass hervorzurufen, ist zumindest unvorsichtig. Unvorsichtig und lebensgefährlich für ihn. General. In a secret speech at Prague Castle to the top of the Nazi administration in the Protectorate, Heydrich said, We want this space completely Germanified. Czechs, after all, will no longer exist here. We cannot say it out loud, but we can start with some things now. First, we need peace in this area for war production. We cannot allow the Czechs to get angry and blow up. I'll say it openly. We can't afford the Czech workers to starve. The Czechoslovak exile government in London did not want to sit back and watch as the elite of the nation was murdered. For example, Czechoslovak general staff suffered losses of generals and top military officials like any other fighting force. Colonel František Moravec, chief of Czechoslovak intelligence in London said, Our best people are being murdered. We must return blow for blow and show the world that the Czechs do not give in, that we will continue to fight, and that the Czechs will not resign to Nazi rule. The plot of the film then moves to Britain, where we can see the training of the Czechoslovak soldiers becoming paratroopers. The plan of the military units was to infiltrate the protectorate, to acquire information about events there, and to carry out various sabotages to damage the German military industry. For the attack on Heydrich, two Czechoslovak soldiers were chosen, Gabčík, Slovak nationality, and Kubiš, of Czech nationality, who were best friends and wanted to parachute into their homeland together. They were trained by leaders in the domain, members of the SOE, Special Operations Executive, specifically Eric Anthony Sykes and William Fairbain. Both men had worked in the 1920s in Shanghai, China, where they fought against drug gangs, prostitution, and where policemen had losses of 20 to 30 men annually. The FS acronym for KNIFE, still used by the Special Forces, is not an abbreviation of Special Forces, but of Fairbain Sykes Knife. Experts from the SOE consulted Gabchik and Kubish on the best way to attack. The paratroopers were instructed to attack Heydrich while he was moving from place to place, that is, when he was least protected. If they were to attack a guarded object, it would have been impossible. Therefore, they should find a corner in Prague where Heydrich's car would have to slow down. At the moment the car passed, they were told to throw two bombs onto the car, one on the front and one on the rear, and, if necessary, 
finished the job using machine guns and pistols. But, as soldiers say, a plan lasts only to the first shot. And in Prague, everything went differently. Paratroopers had practiced throwing a mock bomb on a moving car, but British instructors were not satisfied with their performances, as they hit the car only occasionally. A slightly biased criticism, as the father of one of the instructors had actually been a world champion in this sport. The bombs were constructed in Britain from British anti-tank grenades, and from which one-third of the explosive charge and the steel casing were removed. This was done to prevent the loss of civilian lives from shrapnel. Heydrich had to be killed by the blast of the explosive itself. On December 29, 1941, after the intensive training, a British plane released the paratroopers over the protectorate, along with another paragroup. The paratroopers did not land where they had planned to, but were luckily found by Czech citizens who helped them. Stopy. So vaše? Kroste. Hajni. To je můj rajon. Kde je ten druhý? Jaký druhý? Ty stopy jsou dvoje. Pane. Našel jsem zahřbý to jen padák. Je už špatně zakopaný. Nikomu jsem nic nehlásil. Nebojte se. After some struggle, the paratroopers arrived to Prague and established contact with members of the local resistance. It's important to realize how dangerous it was for the paratroopers to get around in the protectorate because there was a very dense network of German control. For example, one German official was responsible for roughly 590 protectorate citizens, as compared to occupied Holland, where one German official was responsible for about 5,500 Dutch citizens. Furthermore, there were many Czech Germans in the Gestapo ranks who were citizens of Czechoslovakia before the war began. These soldiers were also very familiar with the local environment and often spoke fluent Czech. Therefore, in order to avoid suspicion in Prague, Gabčík and Kubiš were often accompanied by girls. The paratroopers received orders to carry out another sabotage action called Kunenbury, which entailed bombing Škoda's industrial complex near the city of Pilsen. Yes, also the home city of the famous beer. The plan was to set fire to a few piles of straw around the factory so that the British bombers could see where to drop the bombs. Unfortunately, the bombers missed the target and the bombs went elsewhere. While the attack on Škoda was underway, the film shows us Heydrich and Canaris as they survey old Czech crown jewels. Sehen Sie den großen Saphir. Ungeschliffen. 40 Karat. Sie sind ein Kenner, Herr General. Sie kennen den Wert der Dinge. Auch der Menschen, Herr Admiral. Herrlich. Es gibt eine Legende. Wer diese Krone unberechtigterweise aufsetzt, wird in einem Jahr sterben. Sind Sie abergläubig? Although this is a great scene, it is still unsure whether Heydrich actually placed the crown on his head. Nevertheless, he was dead one year later. Gabčík and Kubiš were still looking for a convenient place to attack. They had made contact with František Safarik, an employee at Prague Castle who had informed them of Heydrich's itinerary, including when Heydrich usually arrived at the castle. Heydrich had his official office in Prague Castle, the ancient seat of Czech kings, but his family lived just outside of Prague, in a manor house in the village of Panensky Przezani. The paratroopers considered killing him somewhere in this village, though this would have been devastating for the residents there, as they would have all been undoubtedly executed after the attack. 
paratroopers finally decided on one of the streets in Prague. Heydrich made the attack decision much easier for them as he usually rode alone, accompanied only by his driver Klein, who was his chief of security, at approximately the same time and along the same route every day. Paratroopers chose to attack on a sharp turn in Prague's Kobylisi district and awaited Heydrich's arrival on May 27, 1942. Nebo ne? Znáte Prahu líp jak my. Místo je to dobrý, lepší v Praze nenajdete. Unfortunately, the film doesn't portray the attack very accurately. And many movies that followed took inspiration from this film and repeated the same mistakes. In this scene, three paratroopers are seen waiting for Heydrich at the attack site. The third is Joseph Valchik, who is meant to signal, with a mirror, to the two other men when Heydrich is approaching. According to historians, this is wrong for several reasons. First, the mission to kill Heydrich was commissioned exclusively for Gabchik and Kubish. Second, Valchik had a higher military rank than the other two, meaning Gabchik and Kubish would not have been in charge of their own mission. Thirdly, that particular day in Prague was cloudy, and Valchik would have been unable to signal with the mirror. Lastly, as Valchik was a wanted person, and the Gestapo had his photo hanging in every one of their offices, his presence would have unnecessarily risked the entire team being discovered. But the greatest historical mistake in this scene is that Gabchik stands with his machine gun rifle in the middle of the road, which, according to witnesses of the time, did not happen. This is also illogical as the car could have simply run him over. In reality, Gabchik stood on the sidewalk where he was able to see the car at a distance of one to two meters and would have had plenty of time to shoot. They should have had plenty of time, but in reality, the car seems to have emerged suddenly before the paratroopers without giving Gabchik and Kubish much time to respond. Why was this? Heydrich's car was approaching the curve as a tram stopped to let passengers off. The driver Klein did not want to wait for new passengers to board nor for the tram to set off again. So, breaking traffic laws, he decided to circle the tram from the left side. Said tram was simultaneously blocking the paratrooper's view of the oncoming target car. Not only that, the tram in the movie had two wagons, which made it very long. According to researchers today, though, at the time of this attack, the tram would have actually had three wagons. When Klein overtook the tram, he saw another tram approaching from the opposite direction, which is why he decided to step on the gas, jerking the steering wheel back and swerving right to avoid the approaching tram. Thus, the car suddenly appeared before the paratroopers, meaning the initial plan to throw the first bomb on the front of the car was now impossible. Gabchik instead threw off his coat, which had been covering the machine gun, and tries to shoot, but the gun fails. Heydrich and Klein see a man with a machine gun, and according to Klein, Heydrich orders him to stop the car. As the car slows down, Kubish throws a bomb, hitting the rear of the car and fatally injuring Heydrich with the bomb's blow. Kubish protected his body with his valise, though this did not protect him completely, and even he was wounded from the bomb's blast. The explosion of the bomb was so huge that it blew out the hubcaps of the wheels and even broke the windows of the nearby tram. The paratroopers assumed that Heydrich and Klein were dead and decided to flee to the other side of the road, where they had left their bikes, but their path was blocked by the stopped tram. Klein steps out of the car and pulls out his pistol, but in the excitement, the bullet, and possibly the entire magazine, falls out onto the road. 
Heydrich pulls a gun from the glove compartment of the car and fires several times at runaway parachutists. Kubisch runs down to his bike and rides away. He is then chased by a Czech policeman in civilian clothes, who, quickly realizing that this is a resistance group in action, slows down and flees the scene as well. The Gestapo never discovers the policeman's identity, and he never disposes a testimony. Gabčík runs from the place with Klein chasing him, though Klein's gun still does not work. He runs into a butcher shop, hoping that the shop has a back door, but the shop has no second exit, so instead he doubles back to the street where he sees Klein approaching. Gabčík then shoots Klein twice in the leg, injuring him, and continues on to Melantrich Street, to the Svatoshevi's apartment, where he takes off his bloody shirt, bathes himself, dresses in a new shirt, and then leaves the flat. The Svatoshevi look out the window and see Gabčík buy a bouquet of primroses from a florist and then calmly walk away. Kubish, fleeing on the bike, goes on a crazy ride. He comes to a house that has a batya shoe store and decides to leave his bike there. He runs further in the direction of the Novak family house. Mrs. Novak gets him a new shirt because the one he had was torn and bloody. After changing... Kubish immediately leaves the apartment. Meanwhile, at the scene of the attack, one resourceful nurse, Maria Navarova, stops a truck to take Heydrich to the nearby Bulovka hospital. However, during this short drive, Heydrich says that he feels very ill, so they move him back into the cargo bay where he lays down. Heydrich was brought to the hospital in a relatively good mental state, which is common when the patient is in shock and from the time of arrival insists that he be operated on only by a German Reich doctor, not a Czech German doctor. Ironically, the German doctors who eventually operated on him, Professor Walter Dick and Professor Joseph Holbaum, were born in the Czech borderlands, at the time in Sudetenland, so they were Czech Germans. The Germans immediately launch an investigation, declare martial law, close all the exits from Prague, prohibit funerals of men only after checking the identities of the dead, and instruct all physicians to report any suspicious injuries. They also begin to search the houses and apartments throughout Prague, district after district. All apartment and home owners are instructed to report people they see or living in the area that are not registered with the police. A night curfew was instituted from 9 p.m. until 6 in the morning. Those caught on the street will be shot if they do not stop after the first warning call. A repeating message is broadcast on the radio. He who has knowledge about assassinators and neglects to inform the police will be executed along with his whole family. The Nazis introduced the Zippenhof Institution, which was also used after the von Stauffenberg attempt to kill Hitler, which not only kills the conspirators, but also the rest of their families. The Germans had unleashed fear and terror unto the Czechs, a level of which had never been seen here before. Enraged, Hitler demands 10,000 Czechs be arrested as hostages and executed, though Karl Hermann Frank, the highest Nazi officer of the Third Reich in the Protectorate, second only to Heydrich, talks the fear out of it. He argues that such an extreme degree of oppression would push the Czechs over the limit, and it is most important that this area stay under control. A bounty is declared in the amount of 10 million Czech crowns for the information leading to the paratroopers. The lists of names of executed citizens are announced on the radio and written in the newspapers every day. There were still paratroopers hiding in various apartments around Prague, so it's surprising that no one gave them away, especially because the paratroopers rotated several dozen apartments in the city over a few months. Indrishka Novakova, whose parents were hiding the paratroopers, picks up the bike Kubish left at the Bacha store. While retrieving the bike, she is asked by two women who saw a blood-stained man, who left it there, why she is taking it. Yendrishka promptly replies that it is her father's bike, and that he had an accident, and that she was sent to pick it up. The two women then tell everyone they know about this encounter. It wasn't until after the fact that they realized that the bike incident may have been related to the attack on Heydrich, but it was already too late. The Germans soon arrest and interrogate the two local women. In an attempt to find the girl with the bike, the Germans organize an event at the local cinema to gather about 260 girls from the neighborhood and ask the two local women 
to look through the window where the projector was, whether they recognized any of the girls there as the same as the one in their story. We know now that Andryushka was among the girls that were there in the cinema, though she was able to keep her identity a secret. The two women did not recognize her either, or they too chose to keep her identity safe. However, the Germans' efforts, including hiring top criminologists from Hamburg, were in vain, and the investigation stands still. Due to the constant raids across Prague's apartments and houses, the paratroopers finally gather in the very center of the city, in the crypt of the Orthodox Church of St. Cyril and Methodist on Gareslova Street. A total of seven of them eventually gathered in the church, all without the Gestapo finding out. The majority of them lived downstairs in the crypt, while some of them stood guard on the top floor of the church. Religious ceremonies and activities were still conducted, though none of the attendees knew that there were seven wanted soldiers living just beneath their feet. Only a few people knew the paratroopers' location, some members of the Orthodox Church and several members of the local resistance. The paratroopers would enter the crypt through a small opening in the floor of the church's aisle. Meanwhile, the Germans continued to execute Czechs in large numbers, even for offenses previously considered light. For example, in Mauthausen concentration camp, Czech citizens arrested long before the attack were executed. The famous Führer Teutonicus went so far that the Germans massacred the entire population of the village of Lidice, based solely on the suspicion that the residents of the village had been involved in the attack in Prague. The same fate befell the village of Lejaki. <laughs> Hitler's retaliation extended even beyond people, and in the case of Lidice, meant leveling buildings and the entire village landscape. While all of this was unfolding, on June 4th, in Bolovka Hospital, Heydrich died due to injuries incurred from the explosion. Many people were relieved to hear of his death including some of the highest officials of the Third Reich, as Heydrich had materials on each of them. Das möge den Tschechen zum Ruhme und uns zum Vorteil verhelfen. General. Prosit. An autopsy of his body was ordered. The doctors who had treated Heydrich were relieved to hear that the autopsy had not indicated faulty medical practice on their behalf. There were various rumors of what caused Heydrich's death, though the apparent cause of death is unknown. The autopsy reported that Heydrich had died of shock, though shock is an ambiguous term in the medical community. Unfortunately, the mystery of the exact cause of death will probably remain unsolved. The paratroopers did not particularly like their hideout location, as the crypt and the church itself in which they stayed had no alternative escape route. They considered leaving the church for a safer spot, such as Pilsen, in the coffins of a funeral car, but unfortunately this plan was never realized. Gestapo and their security forces continued to search for the men unsuccessfully, but every epic drama needs a traitor, and this story is no exception. Gestapo's fruitless investigation continued until June 16th, about 20 days after the attack, when the traitor gives the men away. Karel Churda, another Czech paratrooper, who had also trained in Britain and who had been dropped into the protectorate in March 1942, was hiding in his family's house in South Bohemia, close to the city of Budweis. Yes, also the home city of the famous beer. The daily reports of entire families executed and the allure of amnesty provided by the Nazis to anyone who had information on the attackers led Churda to give in. He decides to go to Prague to visit the homes of the families which were hiding the paratroopers but nobody gives him any information. His next stop is the Gestapo headquarters in Prague, where he turns himself in as one of the paratroopers. Members of the Gestapo quickly discover that his story is solid when Churda successfully identifies some of the paratroopers' belongings and their contents. Churda then begins to testify extensively. He reveals the addresses of several apartments in Prague connected to the paratroopers. As a result, the Gestapo puts together a huge arrest party. They also find the apartment of the Moravtsova family on Biskupsova Street, key accomplices of Gabchik and Kubish. Here, the Gestapo arrests the couple, 
though the wife, Maria Moravtsova, manages to swallow a pill filled with poison, thus committing suicide. And thanks to a forged telegram, the Gestapo also arrests their son, Lassimu. After many hours of brutal torture, the son crumbles and tells them where the paratroopers are hiding. Lastimil and his father were later executed together in the Mauthausen concentration camp. The next morning, members of the Gestapo, Waffen SS, and other security forces closed the perimeter around the church. Although the paratroopers saw the Germans coming, they were trapped, because there was no alternate escape route. It would be a fight of seven Czech paratroopers against tenfold odds, more than 700 well-armed members of security forces. Members of the Gestapo were the first to break into the church, where they quickly captured and tied down chaplain Vladimir Petrek. They then make their way down the aisle, where they are met with a wall of fire from three of the paratroopers hidden on the church's gallery. The paratroopers opened fire, causing the first wave of soldiers to turn back. In front of the church, a quarrel breaks out between members of the Gestapo and members of Waffen SS about who should head the attack. Eventually, they agree that Waffen SS should lead the attack as a regular assault unit would be better suited. The Germans even bring in a cannon, though it was not used in the end. Three of the paratroopers, Kubisch, Opalka, and Bublik, managed to hold off the Germans for an incredible three hours, armed only with pistols. It must have been terrible for the remaining four soldiers, Gabchik, Valchik, Ruby, and Schwartz, who were hidden in the crypt under the church floor. They had listened as their comrades fought above them, powerless to help. So their fate is sealed, and after the tiring battle, they lose their lives. As the gunfire dies down, the four soldiers down below know that their time had come. Knowing that there were more than three paratroopers involved, the Germans looked for the hideout of others. They soon find a hole in the floor that leads to the crypt. This was the same hole the paratroopers had used to climb down into the crypt. There was one other entrance to the crypt, a staircase, but this had been walled up. The Germans considered blasting off the wall that blocked the staircase, but they desisted as their orders were to capture the men alive and the explosion may have killed some of them. Next, they began calling to the men through the hole in the floor to ask the paratroopers to surrender, promising to do them no harm. They even summoned traitor Karel Churda to try to convince them, but when that proved unsuccessful, they turned to the priest of the church. Will you talk to the priest? the officers yelled. We do not know any priest, the men replied. The priest made his way to the hole and sadly uttered, I have been told to tell you to surrender, to which the men downstairs replied, Czechs never surrender! The German soldiers then try to jump down to the crypt through the hole, but the paratroopers meet them with gunshots to the legs. When the soldiers try to throw tear gas from the street through the window, the bombs are returned to the street by the men below. Then, the Germans summon firefighters to flood the crypt at a staggering rate of 3,000 liters of water per minute. In the crypt, the men use a ladder to throw the hoses back onto the street. 
but one of the firefighters manages to get a hold of the ladder and pulls it out onto the street, leaving the men below defenseless. The water in the crypt begins to rise. Finally, the Germans decide to blow up the wall blocking the staircase that leads to the crypt. With nowhere left to go and little ammunition left, the final four men decided to end their own lives, each with a single bullet. The whole struggle in the church lasted a whopping seven hours and ended without a single surviving paratrooper. The corpses of these brave Czech men were pulled out of the church, identified, and the heads were then cut off and put in a solution to soak. But until this day, we don't know what happened to them afterwards. The Czech population paid a tremendous price for the attack on Heydrich. It is estimated that the Germans initially killed 1,600 people as retaliation for the attack, but this number grew to over 5,000 before the end of the war. The event proved to the Allied powers that Czechoslovakia would not cower to Nazi rule, and instead would fight back. Such an event just might have helped Czechoslovakia to be restored to its pre-war boundaries, regaining control of its borderlands. As I said at the beginning of this video, of all of the movies that relate to these events, the film Assassination is the best. For the sake of completeness, I'll list other films that pertain to the attack on Heydrich. Even during the war, two American films were released, Hitler's Madman and Hangman Also Die. The second was made by Fritz Lang, a director of Austrian origin who fled the Nazi regime to the USA. A few other Czechoslovakian films include Sokolovo, Lidice. And from the US, Operation Daybreak. Anthropoid. And the man with the iron heart. Throughout this video, I tried to avoid the word assassination or the connection of those who committed the assassination because it would be repeating the words used in Nazi propaganda. By saying that these people committed something or took part in an assassination, a pejorative label is placed on an otherwise heroic action. This plan was carried out in a state of war by military members against Heydrich, a member of the German military. Therefore, I think it is better to call it an attack on Heydrich. Even after the war, the paratroopers received no additional honors. In 1948, when the communist powers gained control over Czechoslovakia, the event went relatively unnoticed, as it had been arranged in the West, in London, rather than in Moscow. However, if you would like to pay tribute to the brave paratroopers today, you most certainly can. You can go to Reslova Street, now one of the busiest streets in Prague, and visit the crypt of the church, or you can drink to their memory just across the street in the pub called By the Paratroopers. Thank you for watching!